Welcome to Guerrillapreneur, the art of waging small business warfare podcast, teaching Davids how to defeat Goliaths. Now here's your host, Mark Anthony Peterson. Welcome back to the podcast for entrepreneurs, startups, and business mavericks. If you're not a maverick, you don't have to go home, but you got to get up out of this podcast. In this podcast, we teach entrepreneurs how to defeat the corporate giant. Just like in the story of David and Goliath, David defeated a much taller and stronger Goliath, not by fighting the giant in hand-to-hand combat, but by using technology, a slingshot. The slingshot allowed the smaller David to attack from a distance that minimized the advantages that Goliath had over the smaller David. My name is Mark Anthony Peterson. I'm a serial entrepreneur a futurist, and the managing executive at CR Consulting, a leading small business strategy and technology consulting firm. I am also the author of the book, Gorilla Panure, Small Business Strategy for David's Wanting to Defeat Goliaths, which is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and iTunes. This podcast is brought to you by CR Consulting. An idea can launch a business, a strategy can take it global. Gorillapreneurs, this is episode 40. Yeah, we made it to episode 40. And we have a very special podcast for you. Dr. Melanie Okura, the co-founder of Eco Alpha Environmental and Engineering Services. And I've followed her journey literally for years. This Sacramento, California-based startup is doing it just like Frank Sinatra. They're doing it their way. And they're doing it and achieving a lot of success while facing down the Goliaths in the industry. I think you're going to enjoy this interview. Episode number 40, Mastermind Interview, Mastermind Interview with Dr. Melanie Okoro. Gorillapreneurs, welcome back. Over the past couple of years, we've brought you Mastermind Interviews with individuals who've been at the forefront of outsourcing. And today we have another great episode with Dr. Melanie O'Core, who is the co-founder of a great company called Eco Alpha. And they are at the cutting edge of a hot growth market. And she's going to tell us her story around launching this business. And we're going to drill down into all of the particulars that you need to think about if you're looking to launch a business. Dr. O'Core. Welcome to Gorilla Panure. Mark, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be a part of the podcast and tell you a little bit about our story. Well, before we get into the story of the business, let's get into your story. Tell us a little bit about you because you have a fascinating background. You had an excellent corporate career going. You were employee of the year, and all of a sudden you decided to launch this business at a time when your life couldn't be going better. So give us some background on, on you. Sure. Just, just a little bit of background about myself. I was born in Cocoa Beach, Florida, but uh, raised in Tuskegee, Alabama. And I actually started at a small historically black college in Charlotte. North Carolina called Johnson C. Smith University. I took a, a couple of wonderful courses in ecology and environmental science and found myself at the University of Maryland in Baltimore County with a PhD in environmental science. From there, I made my way to California, where for 10 years, I worked for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, in many different capacities. But my uh, last couple of years there, I worked as a coordinator for aquatic invasive species, as well as uh, water quality for four states within that region. And those states included Oregon, Idaho, Washington, and the state of California. And so my history with nature and natural resources is one that began from my roots 
in Tuskegee, fishing in those lakes in Alabama, spending time with my great-grandmother and my family, and, and carrying that on through, throughout my professional career with NOAA as a federal scientist. Well, tell us a little bit more about that career at NOAA. You mentioned that you had different types of jobs throughout your time there. You were starting to get recognized for the work that you were doing with NOAA. Right. I spent almost 10 wonderful careers with NOAA Fisheries. Uh, this organization really focused on science, service, and stewardship, what I call the three S's. And during my time there, I can tell you that I learned many different things from individuals who simply love to do work in natural resources, and they cared about their resources as well. And so many of the tasks and roles and responsibilities that I had during my time at NOAA uh, range from one working on aquatic invasive species management plans for the the California Central Valley and the Delta, as well as working on recovery plans for threatened and endangered species, and one of those endangered species being coho salmon, as well as a, a coordinator of programs uh, all focused on managing aquatic invasive species and minimizing their impacts to those threatened and endangered fisheries. And so working uh, with a number of different stakeholders across many jurisdictions and state, private, public, and nonprofit entities, those that were state and federal, gave me at the time the opportunity to have a breadth and depth of knowledge on a number of different topics, uh, all related to natural resource. I also had the opportunity to focus on one of my passions during my time at NOAA that was the focus on diversity and inclusion in the workforce, broadening our thinking and, and expanding our our thoughts and our actions around how do we recruit and retain a diverse uh, community of professionals within NOAA, how do we keep them there, and then how do we cultivate a culture where those talented individuals would stay and then recruit other passionate professionals. And then as a result of those types of actions and activities that I worked on at NOAA. In June of 2018, I received the NOAA Fisheries Employee of the Year Award. And and that, that's been great for me. During my time working for NOAA Fisheries, also had the opportunity to uh, keynote presentations for a number of different conferences, as well as uh, work on uh, various board and organizations that were focused on uh, diversity and inclusion uh, in the workforce. So and I think a combination of all of those types of activities, whether it was the science behind what the impacts were to our natural resources, whether it was service to the public or uh, to uh, the community of diverse professionals, or whether it was simply promoting good stewardship of our trust resources, I think that's really one of the reasons why my peer award was, was, was given to me. You and I have a lot in common in terms of our upbringing. I grew up in a small town doing exactly the same thing that you did in terms of fishing and enjoying the natural resources. In fact, my babysitter, when I was in the first and second grade and in pre-K, whenever we weren't in school, we were with her out at Dallas Lake fishing every chance we got. And and it was one of the most memorable and impactful times of my life as well. And it sounds like it made an impression on you enough to pursue the education and the career. And you're excelling in that career. But at the same time, somewhere there was a drive to start a business. Walk us through how you move from being nominated as an employee of the year to thinking about launching a business and what were those steps you tried to put in place prior to leaving to prepare yourself to succeed? Oh, that, that's a great question, Mark. And I think, you know, if you take a look at my resume, uh, you would see that it says I left NOAA in 2018 and I started a, a business. But the devil really is in the details in that the idea the thoughts behind starting an environmental and engineering firm actually uh, started uh, five, year, five years prior to me leaving NOAA. And what was so interesting about my transition and my process was that when I started with NOAA, my goals were very simple. 
you know, I was a PhD student coming out, newly trained scientist, and simply wanting to uh, start my career in the natural resources field, being very eager and really wanting to focus on the work, focus on doing really good work, and moving up in my in, in my career as NOAA as my skills and my experiences uh, they 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 grew. But you know, as you begin to grow and evolve over time, you develop higher level goals. And those goals aren't just centered around uh, focusing on uh, certain aspects such as money or promotion. Uh, For me, I was really, really interested in building and creating teams to solve some of the problems that that we were dealing with with the NOAA. And wanting to think outside the box and focus in this area, I realized that Within the current uh, position that I was within NOAA, that that reality for me would be much, much, much further in the future than what than what currently I imagine. So I really started this process of saying, if I know I want to build teams to solve complex problems around natural resource management and protection, that I want to uh, create a diverse team of professionals and work with a diverse team of professionals to solve these problems. And that I wanted to implement solutions that were flexible and those that I thought uh, were innovative. Not that they weren't innovative at NOAA. I just wanted to uh, begin to expand uh, my thoughts around that. And so I began to put into place what I believe was the foundation and the infrastructure to fast four or five years ahead make make that leap. Well, for me, I would call it a transition from the public sector to the private sector and make that transition very thoughtfully, uh, knowing that there were there's inherent risk in the process, whether it was a, a small or a large decision I had to make, there was inherent risk involved, but being very confident in my abilities to say, you know, that this is the right time to make the transition. Can you give us one or two concrete items that you put in place to mitigate the risk? I know when I talk to entrepreneurs, I give them the exact same advice that I started four or five years ahead of time planning to launch my first major startup. And one of the things I did was make sure I signed up for every rewards program available so that I would have membership miles and I would have frequent flyer miles that would help me make the cost of launching my business a lot lower. So when I left... I had a million points on two different airlines and a million (laughs) points with two different hotel chains, major hotel chains. Whenever I pitched my business, I never had to pay for an airline ticket or hotel room, which made it easy to get those early sales off the ground. What about you? What What are one or two concrete steps that you could share with the audience that you said, when I move out, I'm going to make the, the, the transition easier? Right. I think, you know, one of the first things that I will say, and it, it really is a change in your mindset and, and your way of thinking, you know, from a, a scientist perspective, I think that we're taught to be very narrowly focused on the field uh, that we were trained in. And so what it required was really for me to expand my thinking as an entrepreneur. And one of those concrete ways that I did that was that I sought out and spoke with entrepreneurs that were in the field that I was in, confidently I did, and requested that they be confidential uh, with what I was expressing to them, which is just a need to better understand their world, how entrepreneurism works, what are some of the pitfalls that I need to be thinking about, what are some of the gains and advantages to being an entrepreneur, and really where, where should I start in that process? And so out of that came a concrete action for me was to every day have an affirmation for myself that I am the leader of an organization. And if you can tell yourself that every day, every action, every move that you make, then reflect what the future will be. And then that second concrete action was to start to develop the foundation. So first, I'm telling myself, I'm also telling others out loud before I even lose Noah, 
that this is what this is what my plans are for the future. So speaking those plans into existence. And then that second concrete word of advice is to talk with those entrepreneurs and identify what it really takes to run and operate a business and to be an entrepreneur. And one of the first steps in that is to say, well, you have to have that foundation. So for me, I talked with quite a few entrepreneurs. And actually, Mark, you were one of those entrepreneurs I talked with uh, back in 2014. I don't know if you remember that conversation. I'll never forget that conversation. But one of the concrete pieces of advice that you provided to me, and, 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 and my apologies that I'm stealing this advice, but it was so helpful. I mean, I think why I'm so rooted in reality right now as an entrepreneur is that you have to understand the cost of being an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You have to understand how much capital you're going to need, when you're going to be able to turn a profit, uh, why you might not be able to, and then how to pivot uh, when necessary. And I think that um, you said to me, Melanie, make sure you have your structure solid in place, whether it be a sole proprietorship or an LLC. Make sure you have those the business fundamentals in place. You you know your numbers and have your accountant. You have the insurances. You understand the cost and you understand the risk. And I took that to heart and it took me all those years. But I'll tell you that that probably was one of the most important things I did because when it was time to transition, the foundation was solid. And and, and that, those are two concrete actions that I would say future entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs need to, to, to take in, in order to be successful in, in this industry. You have successfully done that. And now you are aligning yourself in, a, in one of the faster growing areas of, of outsourcing in, in terms of being able to provide the environmental services to companies that may not have the engineering or in-house staff, you're in that sweet spot. Tell us about your business. Tell us about uh, Eco Alpha and what problems you're solving for some of the companies that are faced with the types of problems that you were dealing with when you were on the NOAA side of the business. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about um, from the from the perspective of, of what who we are as a company uh, and what our core services are. So we are a, a small women owned minority business and we provide environmental consulting and engineering staffing and training services to the private and the public. Well, that's pretty broad. And so what does that mean? In the environmental field, we really help public and private companies streamline the permitting process, help them work with uh, other agencies, whether they're acquiring that permit, helping them address any issues associated with their process. But really, our goal is to get them to the finish line as quickly as we possibly can. And I think that was one of the issues as a federal scientist was where it was needed the most is really we supplied that technical level of support and to help them move through the permitting process. In the engineering division, we provide engineering consulting, but also staffing to commercial buildings. We've been very successful in this arena and expanding throughout California, our REIT and our service. All in all, in in the Environmental and Engineering Services Division, we simply strive to be the trusted experts for our clients. We want to service them in all aspects of their interaction with the regulatory and permitting process and, and in their engineering staffing. So we like to align ourselves with their needs first and then we help them identify what areas they should focus on in order to get them to the finish line. And for us, that's really been the cutting edge of our field, is to really focus on that service piece. I remember talking about NOAA and NOAA having a service science and stewardship component. We've really taken our level of service and our clients to the next level. We want to make sure we're providing them with the best, available information for them to make a decision and really help them do that process. So we take we take our, 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 our model very seriously, these trusted experts, because what we found throughout working in the field 
is that when you become a trusted advisor and a trusted expert, your clients will always rely on you to provide them uh, with the information they need to succeed. So let me unpack that a little bit to help the audience understand just how big of an impact you're having on your clients. When you talk about the permitting process, help us understand how much it costs a company to not have that permit on a per day basis or a per, per month basis before they could actually start work on a, on a major initiative. I'm assuming that that could cost them thousands of dollars as they wait to get the permit through the process. And if it's a huge project, we could be pushing five digit, six digit numbers and no value has been created by that particular client because no permit has been issued. So unpack that for us a little bit and and tell us about the, the amount of value you bring to those to those companies. Sure. I'll give you an example of a project where a a private company would like to build a a bridge or a culvert. Well, there are a number of permits that are required to dredge in those waters. There are a number of permits that are required for the species that will be impacted as a result of that project. Uh, that permit might for example, just so it would cost about $16,000 for that permit. However, prior to obtaining that permit, there are a number of environmental impact assessments that have to be completed prior to the issuance of a permit. Ideally, uh, a project of that magnitude is, is relatively small, and in essence, it should only take about six months from uh, the uh, start to the completion of the project. Well, many companies are unaware of the amount of time that it takes to develop an adequate environmental impact assessment or a biological assessment. The amount of meetings, the number of meetings and conversations that have to take place in order for the the many stakeholders that are involved in the process to even understand the project, the impact of the project on those species and the waterways and how the project is going to be implemented. And so when we talk about streamlining the permitting process, we're really talking about time, right? The time that it takes to implement a project from start to finish. And when you don't have that information or a company that understands how the process works, understands how the players on the other side are thinking about the project and really can speak their language and provide them what they need. A project that would take six months could be extended that I've seen to two years. And during that process, you're spending money on project managers, on consultants. You're spending time, going to meetings, having phone conferences, that all of that is, is, is cost. And that's really important because, remember, the ultimate goal is to complete the project. And so think about the cost of not completing that project at all or a, two, a two-year hiatus on a project that was so essential for the uh, highway improvement and, and the roads. So it's really important to have uh, knowledgeable advisors, uh, advisors that understand the process, uh, and advisors that are willing to tell you where your pitfalls are and how to under- overcome those hurdles. So for companies that are in this space, they have a choice. They can try to maintain that expertise in-house, or they can outsource that to you where you can bring the expertise, as you mentioned earlier, and streamline the process and save them tremendous amounts of money because they are able to get to work faster. Absolutely. You really hit the nail on the head. Yes. And then on your engineering side, it sounds like you're doing the same thing, that there are opportunities for companies to save by either coming to you to get the expertise 
or getting that expertise, that engineering expertise on a short term basis to solve specific environmental problems. Am I thinking about that side of the business correctly as well? I would say yes, but I'd also like to add to that, that especially for our engineering side, we've really focused on uh, service and customer service. So on our engineering side, you know, we're able to provide uh, short-term and long, long-term staffing of engineers for Class A commercial buildings, and we provide that level of expertise. We can come in with highly trained, high-performance building engineers and fully operate and maintain a building. We began on day one, and so we're able to save our clients time, reducing the time that it takes for a staff member or employee to get up to speed on a building, reducing uh, the amount of service call to third-party vendors, which also saves them money. Because they're highly trained engineers, they're able to repair and out many of the repairs that are outsourced. So, again, they become a resource day one, not on day 90 after they've been there for 90 days and gone through a number of trainings and and really tried to get up to speed with the building. We are focused on making our engineers working engineers on day one. And that really has proven to be a really successful model for us. We focus on training. We focus on customer service. And we focus on our engineers staying up to date on the new advances in technologies on how to operate and maintain buildings. We integrate all environmental aspects of operating and maintaining buildings. One, because they're really all interconnected and linked. Many of the buildings are buildings that would like to either be LEED certified. They want to make sure there are sustainable uh, practices that they're implementing within their building. And so it's very easy for us to have a vertical approach to uh, the work that we do within these buildings with respect to our engineering as well as our environmental services. All in all, our goal is really to focus on our clients, the tenants and the occupants of the building, and to operate and maintain those buildings. But the bottom line is that we could do this because we simply save our clients money. And that's why they continue to come back to us. That makes sense. Now, you have in your space some giants that also focus in on providing services similar to yours. How are you able to defeat or at least compete with the Goliaths that are already in the space? You know, um, we've, we've turned the competitive model on our heads. You know, we, we've carved out a very special niche uh, for our company. Uh, within this industry. And having a high level of service as well as additional products that we provide that really help our engineers specifically uh, be uh, high-performance building engineers on day one, I really think that's kept us on the cutting edge uh, within the industry. We've also really focused on specifically in training of engineers collaborating with those that might be seen as competitive in the space, right? Identifying opportunities where it's mutually beneficial for all parties to work together in that space. And I think because we've taken a a very different approach to the industry, it's what has allowed us to be so successful in that industry. That is a wonderful answer. That's the advice I've been giving to gorillapreneurs for the last two years. First is to find that niche market, to find that area that's ignored by the giant and specialize in serving that better than any other player in the market. And it sounds like you've done that. And then the second is coopetition, right? Figuring out how to compete and cooperate at the same time so that you benefit they benefit, but at the same time, you're learning more competencies that they have developed because they have a lead on you in the market. So coopetition and finding that niche, it sounds like you have a perfect formula for staving off the Goliaths in your space. 
you know what? And and I will say right now it's 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 a really good model for us and it's a really good f- formula. But if you go back to uh, our earlier conversation and talking about evolution, and for us, it's the model is good at present, right? And so within our organization, we're always thinking about the the next evolution of the the, the company or the next model for us, right? And so we want to be resilient always as a company so that as the, really, the, the, we think that, you know, the road will change for us. You know, it might get a little bit bumpy. It might become smooth. We want to simply be resilient in the space and then continue to grow. And so the model works really nicely for us right now, but we are always thinking about the next evolution and where the market is going. Gorillapreneurs, I hope you heard every word of that last set of phrases. You have to take to heart that last phrase I say at the, every, at the end of every podcast. If you aren't breaking something, your company might be the next thing that gets broken. You're always thinking of reinventing your business model. Once it starts to work, you start thinking about the next thing that works. Because if you don't stay ahead of the competition, the competition will break your company. That is such wise advice to our audience to let them know that you just aren't sitting around and enjoying what's working today, that you're already trying to break it. Right. And, you know, one of the things I will say is that don't be afraid to break it. I I say embrace it, right? Because really, that's what being an entrepreneur is all about. It's about creating and building and breaking and creating again. And so for uh, many entrepreneurs, one uh, piece of advice I'd like to share is that embrace the risks associated with being an entrepreneur, uh, plan for as best you can uh, for each phase of your transition, but don't be afraid to break the model and to uh, recreate a better model. Always, always better, not necessarily, doesn't even have to be bigger. Uh, but a better model to fit the climate that you're in so you continue to be resilient uh, to any perturbations that might come within the market because they will come. So that's, that's, that's my one piece of advice to entrepreneurs. Now, the business that you're in, this is not the typical company that most people think of when they think about entrepreneurship. So finding clients has to be a little different than, say, your traditional, you know, consulting <laughs> firm. How do you go about finding clients? What's your networking experience like? Right. So, um, I, you know, I'll, I'll share with you our networking experiences, but I'll be careful about telling you how we find, find clients. We, we, we might have some competitors out there, out there that, listening to your right. podcast. Sure. <laughs> exactly. Right. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll talk to you a little bit about networking. And, you know, I think I'll start back as early as my undergraduate days and really being very shy in terms of how I interacted and engaged with others. It really is a part of my personality to be an introvert. Doesn't mean that I'm not a good communicator, though. And so always cherishing the networks that I have continuing to be consistent with those networks. And essentially, uh, those days at NOAA, I was the product, right? Completing the work, having integrity, doing what you say that you're going to do. And so when you're transitioning into the private sector and you're asking those former colleagues or those peers uh, to now consider you, it's a big ask, right? But if you've nurtured those networks, uh, if you've been a great colleague, if your product products are are very good products and you have integrity, it's not difficult to get someone to say yes. You know, what's difficult is the ask, right? And so for us, and I have to to mention my the co owner and mechanical engineer. Uzama Okoro, who, who also happens to be my husband and, the, and, and partner in the business, I, 
say that he's excellent in terms of networking and making sure that he's consistent. So for us, networking has been a huge part of uh, the successful launch of our company. We had to reconnect with those networks in the private and public sector, and we simply had to ask. And so we always are making sure that we're networking and communicating and we're talking and we're asking about the market and we're asking what needs improvement and and we're willing to take take on the task of making those improvements and so i i would say that's how how we've been able to find the clients that we have it's really first and foremost a really good word of mouth but that's what word of mouth is is that it's through networks most entrepreneurs may not believe this but it is absolutely true Your first 18 months of revenue comes directly from your network. You're selling yourself because you don't have a brand. You may have a limited infrastructure. And so you're selling exactly what you just laid out. Your integrity, your consistency, and your personal brand. And if you have none of those things... You're going to have to find someone other than yourself that has those things that you can leverage to get your business off the ground. Because without that network, you don't have the ability to give get people to give you that kind of feedback that you just mentioned to help you improve the solution to the point where it has the value that customers who don't know you are willing to put cash on the table for. I want to go down a path that you opened up at the beginning of the podcast when you mentioned that you are focused on building a diverse company. And Tuskegee is the largest institute that graduates the most number of engineers of color in the world. And so being that hidden gem and producing that many engineers, I've always said that's Alabama's greatest resource. You're building a company in a space that most people don't expect people of color to build. And you're doing it and building a diverse workforce. What has that been like? Well, first, it's been intentional. And, you know, one argument that that I've heard in the past, having um, worked on a number of different diversity and inclusion issues, is that the numbers aren't there. We don't know how to connect and engage with those students. We just don't have a pool to pull from. And as you mentioned, just one concrete example is Tuskegee University. And, you know, for us, we're just very intentional about the professionals that we bring to the team, to Eco Alpha, our family. And in that conversation that we have, when we're bringing on our next hire, we always think about uh, diversity uh, of perspectives, experiences, skills, thought, and very intentional about making sure that all ethnicities are represented, represented within our hiring process. And so we're just very intentional about when we're going through the hiring process, not just putting out a job solicitation and then bringing in uh, those candidates, but reaching out to our network of individuals from our diverse community of STEM professionals and letting them know that we have these opportunities so that the pool of applicants that we have are representative of the diverse communities that we work in every day. And because of that, being that intentional in the first step of our process, it has been, for us, really great to have a company that's reflective of those communities. That is powerful because you're doing what many companies just pay lip service to. So when I learned that about your business, it really inspired me as I now see more and more schools introducing STEM and STEAM projects 
into curriculums that hadn't had it before. It tells me that there's opportunities for more young people to get involved in these sorts of complex environmental problems, engineering problems, and be at the forefront of not only working in companies, but founding them like yourself. You know, I agree. And I think that when you think about the next generation of engineers uh, and environmental professionals, these individuals want to solve problems that are relevant to society. And reframing the work that we do, and when I talk about being able to solve complex problems, that's what I mean, those that are relevant to society. So when we think about how to recruit uh, and retain those professionals, there's this uh, intrinsic, intrinsic value that the next generation of professionals have that is simply not just centered around uh, having a, a, uh, a degree or some higher level degree uh, with letters behind your name. It's about whether or not their work means something. Can it help their community? What does it mean to society? And so as we begin to build our company and as we begin to expand, we've thought about this, the social component and how to build that in uh, within our company is a strategy for us that's evolving and growing. But I always like to say to, to start uh, where you can. You don't have to solve all problems. And so we start with our hiring process and just making sure that we're intentional, that our hiring pool really reflects the communities that we work in and, and reflects, reflects the society reflects, reflects the society that we live in. And that's, that's our first step. That's, that's really our first step. I will tell you, Mark, that you know the larger companies, we have a, a little bit of advantage over the larger companies because we're able to pivot. We're much more agile than they, than they are because we have our levels are very simple, right, and hierarchy, right? right? So we're able to pivot, make a decision very quickly, right? And some uh, bigger organizations, just like the bigger ship boats, aren't able to turn as fast as we can. And so because of that, we've just been very successful uh, in that model and thinking about how to continue to be successful in this model as we grow and expand is really something that we, a conversation that we've been having over the last three months or so. I want to, I want to peel the onion back a little bit more on your discussion uh, around hiring and the makeup of the company and, and focus on you as a female executive co-founder, top executive at a environmental services firm. What has that experience been like? What are the obstacles? And just talk me through how you, you, you push down those barriers. You know, I, I really want to say that, you know, the field of environmental science is really an exciting field with respect to diversity and gender equity. You know, for example, I was really proud to work at NOAA because if, if you uh, took an hourly look at the demographics, of the women that were within NOAA, uh, there were quite a few, almost an equal number of, of women to men in terms of, of gender. And however, uh, in terms of the higher level position, positions, there was a disparity. And so what I was always proud of working for NOAA was because they were aware of those issues and the leadership was just actively involved and engaged in addressing those issues but also other issues around uh, diversity and inclusion as well. And so when, I, when I'm asked to talk on this topic, I always say that my field is bright. I, I don't feel as though, you know, the field is in trouble. I think we're going in the right direction. Would I like it to go a little bit faster? Of course. Would I like to see more women in higher level positions? Absolutely no question. And when I continue to focus on that and be vocal about it, absolutely. But this field is an amazing field uh, of women that are really leading the way and leading the charge. When you began building your business, did you pull from the NOAA-type resources to build a board of advisors? I know that's always been a conversation that I, I start with with a lot of, 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 of entrepreneurs where did you go to get 
your advice, your support when you were in that building phase? One of the areas that I sought out um, was I sought out a, a, a business lawyer. I ran a number of <laughs> and and a business lawyers and uh, senior level environmental scientists in the field who were in leadership positions. One because really I I needed to have a pro bono uh, board of advisors in those earlier phases, and they were happy and willing to spend time talking with me and advising me on that process. And so in the earlier days, I sought out senior level leadership uh, scientists within NOAA and outside of NOAA and other federal agencies as well, and then uh, a business lawyer to sit on the uh, advisory, my pro bono advisory board. I also sought out a different, a different type of advice and leadership, and that was one from a woman who owned and ran a nonprofit and had done this for many, many years, was very successful. And to me, that was the type of uh, advice and direction that I needed at the time to be able to run a, a essentially a company that was nonprofit. There are aspects of the nonprofit that, as everyone knows, there you're an entrepreneur, right? You're you're asking folks to support a cause. You're probably getting very little pay for it, right? And it's all focused on uh, a social cause. And so for me, it was very important to have a different perspective on, on my pro bono advisory board than what would be considered traditional. And then finally, I sought out others like you, Mark, who had had experience and, and much success as an entrepreneur uh, in this arena. And when I could, I would tap, tap those individuals to, to solicit advice from as well. In the early stages, it was really all pro bono for for us, uh, and and I thank those today for for the time that they gave to me during those early stages. So tell us about the future. Where do you want the business to go? What do you want your legacy to be? You know, it's very interesting that you you talk about um, legacy. I, I talked earlier about those higher level goals. Uh, and about a week and a half ago, I gave a keynote at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and really talked about leaving a legacy, really uh, focus on uh, a legacy uh, for my family, a legacy for uh, women uh, in the STEM profession. Focus around uh, two key areas that I simply didn't remain silent when there was an opportunity to speak and that I remain visible when there might have been opportunities for me to hide. And so I want to leave a legacy where I am can support women in the STEM field and that those efforts are sustainable long after I'm gone. And that it doesn't, this social component doesn't operate outside of being an entrepreneur or outside of our business, that the values are intertwined such that as the business grows, so does our social impact. And really, that's where, you know, for me and my, and, and my business partner, my husband, that's what we, we talk about on a daily basis, being able to leave a legacy that as our social impact grows, as our business grows, then, the, then, then all becomes healthy and, and our legacy is sustainable. That is a, a great message and, and a great answer. Sustainability to create a brand that lasts beyond your years. And when we look at some of the greatest companies that are out there that have been around 100 plus years, that's exactly the type of framework and model they tried to put in place. is a sustainable business that feeds the core principles of its original founders. And if, when you succeed in doing that, you'll have more than just a financial impact on this community that we call the United States. This has been a wonderful discussion. I've enjoyed learning so much about you and your business, where you're headed, the impact you're having. I would ask, is there any other message you'd like to leave to entrepreneurs 
in particular, those Tuskegee students who are going to listen to this podcast? Sure. Uh, I would say that for many years, I dreamed about creating a business um, and building a company and creating opportunities for underrepresented groups to just prosper in the STEM field. And now I have an opportunity to do that through, through our company. And I would say that if you can dream it and you can be persistent and consistent in who you are as a person and your integrity and your ability to get the job done and come up with solutions, then you can go anywhere. You can create the life that you've always dreamed of. And for me, I can say right now, it's a wonderful life. And so with that, to, to my fellow uh, skiians, you know, if, 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 if this country girl can do it, then you can too. Where can the audience go to find out more about Eco Alpha? Well, they can first go to www.eco-alpha.com. They can also uh, find us on Twitter at eco, E-C-O underscore alpha. Uh, they can also find us on Facebook at eco-alpha environmental and engineering services. And finally, on Instagram, where we really love to share our stories uh, and who we are uh, with the public at eco-alpha. We're going to put all of those links in the show notes for all of you who want to follow Eco Alpha and all the different platforms that they're on. Dr. Okor, this has been really inspiring, motivating, and touching. I appreciate the kind words from you. Thank you again for being on the podcast, and we look forward to following your success. Thank you, Mark. That was Dr. Melanie Okor of Eco Alpha Environmental and Engineering Services. If you didn't learn something from today's interview, it's because you weren't listening. We'll have all the ways that you can contact Eco Alpha Environmental and Engineering Services and Dr. Okoro in the show notes. Guys, if you like what you hear, subscribe to the show. Share the love and share the show. Leave comments and leave reviews. We're looking forward to bringing you the next 40 episodes, and they're going to be exciting. Gorillapreneurs, Scott Sullivan said it best in episode seven, be a mace, sharpen those spikes. And remember, if you're not breaking something, your company might be the next thing that gets broken. Thank you for listening to the Gorillapreneur, the art of waging small business warfare podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, you may also enjoy the book Gorillapreneur, small business strategy for David wanting to defeat Goliath. Available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and iTunes. Follow Mark Peterson on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at at Gorillapreneur. Now I want to close with a quote from the great Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu. Victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first, then seek to win. Keep fighting, Gorillapreneurs!